Welcome to segment two of week two. We'll now turn to another of the questions posed by Michael Halliday, questions about features of the grammar of English. As you recall, he poses these questions, he asks these questions uh, with a view to illustrating how we can explain features of the grammar. The short version of this question is why the, or why the, or why the. Let's, let me start by going back to an example from the first segment. When we look at the analysis of an example, the grammatical analysis of an example, in a sense, a minimal anatomical analysis, in terms of the anatomy of the grammar would include the constituency of the clause organized into groups or maybe groups and phrases and the component units of the groups words and the component units are words morphemes and the exercise that i mentioned and discussed in segment one had to do with the assignment of words to word classes. So I gave you an example of a taxonomy of word classes with a few steps in the taxonomy, increasing the granularity or delicacy in the classification of words. Now we'll be concerned with one particular word, the it belongs to the word class of determiners. Determiners are nominal words, together with numerals, adjectives and nouns. These are words that function in the nominal group. So we will discuss the nominal group, not only in terms of its anatomy, the component parts, but also the physiology, as it were. What functions these different class of words serve in the nominal group. If you take the example from uh, shown here, the bree gentle breezes blew over the Nile, then the last unit is a nominal group, downranked, embedded in a prepositional phrase over the Nile, and that is a determiner, and the other nominal word is Nile, a noun. So let's focus on determiners, the class of nominal words that the belongs to. To get a sense of what its siblings are, or the other members of the family of determiners, let me show you a display from the fourth edition of Halliday's Introduction to Functional Grammar, Halliday Matheson 2014. You have that in your e-libraries. When we look at items that can serve to point or determine the nominal group, we can distinguish between demonstratives and possessives. And in a sense, either giving information, determinative, or the demanding information, interrogative. And we can locate the known traditionally only as a definite article, contrasting with the indefinite article, among the class of demonstratives that are determinative. So the immediate neighbors are this, that, these, those. And that's the best way of understanding the contribution that that makes in the overall construction of meaning in the wordings of the normal group. So it com contrasts with the demonstratives, this, that, these, those, and also the possessives, where the identification, the specificity, the definiteness is signaled by reference to a possessor. My, your, our, his, her, its, and so on. And as I said before, these all contrast with the interrogatives that demand information, either demonstratively or possessively. Now, one of the characteristics of the grammar of English 
in general and the grammar of the nominal group in English in particular is the high frequency of the where other languages might simply leave it implicit English frequently again and again specifies the specific or identifiable status of the referent of a nominal group using the so we can ask as Halliday does why the it's one of the questions he asks in this article we've been looking at on explanation in systemic functional theory it's his question illustrating explanation is question number 10 and the full question is why are English speakers so fond of the word the the so-called definite article so he writes the example I gave the tennis racket to John illustrates a feature familiar to teachers of English as a foreign language sometimes called second mention the word the here signals that the tennis racket was already being talked about it may not actually have been mentioned but is being treated by speak by the speaker as something already known or and identifiable this is valid as far as it goes but it is only one of its meanings one out of essentially three contexts which call for the definite article in order to get a rounded picture of any semantically rich feature in the grammar of the language of a language we try to look at it from three different angles of vision from below how it is expressed from roundabout what are the systemic alternatives to it so other choices that could be made and from above what it means its homogenic function or functions let's look at the word the in this threefold perspective and you can treat this also as an example of Halliday's trinocular vision because it applies not only to the but to all features all aspects of the grammar you consider the tennis racket in I gave the tennis racket to John the three different angles of vision from below from roundabout and from above let's take these one by one one these angles of vision from below how it is expressed from below we're talking about a monosyllabic word the spelled t-h-e and typically pronounced with a reduced vowel the the so when we cite it we might say the but in connected speech is usually the the this word occurs in the nominal group where it comes at the beginning which is where english puts all the little words which have this function of locating the group phrase or clause within its context or situation so this is good to remember because it will provide us with a connection to the first area of the clause grammar we look at the clause is a message and the textual organization of the clause specifically the significance the textual significance of the beginning of the clause but now we're starting with the nominal group for example the stately residence the largest and most brightly colored hummingbird anyone had ever seen And here is an example I've taken from the beginning of a English version of a traditional folk tale. It comes from Guatemala. This is the very beginning of the folk tale, so it's the placement or the orientation to the narrative. And also the first significant event, the initiating event. Now let me color code the and other little words at the beginning of the nominal groups in this passage these are all determiners and they serve a pointing or deictic function in the nominal groups now red that picks out the blue this those and in principle if they occur that these the this those and that these these are demonstratives 
this, that, these, those are selected demonstratives, meaning I'm pointing, I'm telling you where, near me or not near me. But the is non-selective. It just tells you, you should be able to identify this. The other specific determiners specify or identify the reference in terms of possession. So these are the possessive determiners. Like his, her, it's there in this passage. So in the very first paragraph, you have pyramids, palace and temples of stone stand silent and abandoned, hidden by dense forests. But that was not always so. Long, long ago, great cities built by the Mayan people were centres of activity. The Mayan people. Then later on, you get introduction of a chief and then the chief's wife wanted a child. So a child is introduced and the child was born on the 13th day of the month. And as you can see, if you look at this, there are quite a few instances of the many tokens of this type of determiner. And it is, in fact, the most common one of the specific determiners. You have a few, just a couple of three uh, selected demonstratives in one of those cities. But this child, just like this hummingbird. So those away from me, this near me. That's the demonstrative sense of the selective demonstratives. And then you have a few possessives. His younger brother, his place, her heart, her prayers, and so on. And you have, in fact, one relative. A number of them are similar to the interrogatives. Whose name has long been forgotten? Whose name? So that's also a specific uh, determinant, but it's interrogative, or rather relative. So this is what Halliday says about the other view, the second view, not from below, but from round about. What are the systemic alternatives to it? So what are the choices that could alternatively be made? Given the normal group, the car, what are the systemic alternatives to the? We could specify the car by who it belongs to, my car, her car, etc. And wh where it can be found, this car, that card. So this car near me, that car away from me. Or we could ask for the specification, we could ask for the specification, whose car, which car, what car. Or we may not specify it at all, a car, any car. These are non-specific or indefinite. All these choices make up the system of deixis within which the parameters of the are given value and defined. So this, that, for example, are alternatives to the. So choices in how the meaning of pointing is constructed through the wordings of the grammar. So for example, taking a passage we've just looked at. In one of those cities, so those instead of the or these, demonstrative, he knew that his younger brother, so his possessive, rather than her younger brother or their younger brother, or your younger brother, and rather than demonstrative, like uh, that this younger brother, that younger brother, the younger brother. And finally, the, in the chief's wife, which essentially just says, the chief has been introduced, it's identifiable to you, or is being treated as identifiable. So we can set a system, up a system of the choices from round about. What are the systemic alternatives? The basic choice is between treating the reference of the nominal group as specific or identifiable or as non-specific or non-identifiable. So identifiable or specific means you're treating it as something that 
your listeners or your readers should be able to recover. Because you mentioned it before, because it's in some sense obvious from the shared visual field, because it's generally, generically identifiable. If it's treated as specific identifiable, you can specify it by reference to possession, ownership, or demonstrative, proximity. Then we have the selective ones. I'll tell you where. This near me, that away from me. Or non-selective, I won't tell you. I'm treating it as something you have enough information to identify. And the red one then is our old friend, the. So here are examples in the passage we looked at. Possessive, his younger brother, his place. Non-selective, the chief's wife wanted a child. And selective demonstrative, in one of those cities there lived an old Halak eunuch or chief. And non-specific, there lived an old Halak eunuch or chief. Once the chief has been introduced, of course, he can be treated as specific, the chief. And finally, the third angle of approach, from above. What it means, its function or simogenic function or functions. So Halliday writes, from above. English, as we've seen from the structure of the clause, starts by indicating how things fit into the discourse. Well, this is something we'll see in the next couple of weeks when we begin to, begin to examine the clause as a message. We look at the system of theme. With a normal group, this means locating the entity by reference to the here and now, the context of situation. If it is an abstract entity, it transcends the context of situation and is given no location at all. It is not further identified. But if it is concrete, whether living or non-living, its role in the discourse is construed by deictic. So deictic function, typically first in the normal group as just described, either specifically in terms of proximity or ownership, demonstrative or possessive, or non-specifically if it doesn't seem to matter. Now, suppose you want to signal simply that you know which one I mean, I'm not giving you any further hint. We introduce the normal group with the. So, to repeat the example we had before, but the chief's wife wanted a child, the chief's. So these represent the three angles of interpretation, the three views on the Halliday's trinocular vision, the trinocular view of from below, from above, from round about. You can see from round about, that's in the middle. That's a representation of the choices, the systemic alternatives to the let me just review what Halliday said. So from below, we're looking at the in terms of its pronunciation. So we're talking about a monosyllabic word spelled T-H-E and typically pronounced with a reduced vowel, the, the. This word occurs in the nominal group where it comes at the beginning, which is where English puts all the little words which have this function of locating the group, phrase or clause within its context or situation. So as I said before, we'll meet it in the clause as a function of theme. Theme, as it were, the clausal analogue to the dialectic element of the normal group. So notice that it's a very short word. It's very reduced in terms of its pronunciation. From roundabout, well, this is what these choices represent, where the angle brackets represent alternatives, so type of dexis, either personal, possession, or demonstrative, proximity. Mood or dexis, either determinative, I'm telling you, or interrogative, you tell me. And then a bit further down, if demonstrative and determinative, either selective, near, far, and then there's a distinction in number, plural, non-plural, 
O non-selective, our old friend the. Or personal, determinative, in which case it's possessive, either with respect to, in reference to an interactant, my, your, are, or a non-interactant, he, it's, her, his, their. So from roundabout, a given, uh, sorry, a given a normal group, the car, what are the systemic alternatives to the? We could specify the car by who it belongs to, my car, her car, etc. Or it can be found, or where it can be found, this car, that car. Or we can ask for the specification whose car, which car, what car. Or we not, may not specify it at all, a car, any car, some car. All these choices make up the system of Dx's within which the parameters of any given value is defined, as I, I suggested briefly in the walkthrough of this schematic representation of the choices. Thirdly and finally, from above, from the point of view of semantics, from above, English, as we've seen from the structure of the clause, again, we'll come back to that when we look at the clause as a message in the next couple of weeks, starts by indicating how things fit into the discourse. With a normal group, this means locating the entity by reference to the here and now, the context of situation. That is, the referent of the entity noted by the normal group is identifiable. You know which one I mean. I'm not going to give you any further hint. That's the, from the point of view of semantics. It's meaning. So we have the, this dimension of uh, the hierarchy of stratification. Semantics, lexicogrammar, phonology. And we've looked briefly at the from the vantage point of all three, starting with phonology, then looking at lexicogrammar, specifically from roundabout, the alternative options, and then semantics. What does that mean? What does it denote? What does it signify? But there is another important dimension we can also consider. And this is that mention that connects the overall potential, the meaning potential, the wording potential, the sounding potential of the language, what people can mean, to actual particular instances in text. So we can set up this kind of instantiation from potential to instance, from the system of the axis or determination to particular selections in text. And when we look at one text and then another text and then another text, we can count the instances. We can count this actual selection of the, and of course, of other items. And when we count them, we can represent them as a chart. And this is a very simple chart where I've considered a number of different texts, a little corpus of texts. On the horizontal axis, the x-axis, you have frequency. And on the other axis, I've just ordered grammatical and lexical items. The y-axis, the, the, the vertical axis. So when we look at the horizontal axis, the longest bar, that represents the most frequent item in English. What's the most frequent, frequent item in English? Well, as it turns out, the. That's a very interesting fact of, Engl of English. And of course, it's one where it's dramatically different from Chinese, like Mandarin or Cantonese. Because Chinese, like many languages, or even most languages, are not obsessed <laughs> with always specifying the diacritic status of the normal group. So if you look at the uh, vertical axis now, you can go from bottom to, to, to upwards and you can see the list of the most common items. The, 
of and to a in is that was etc one thing that's striking is that these are all grammatical items determiners conjunctions prepositions common verbs pronouns i may have said that already <laughs> So they're grammatical items or function words rather than lexical items or content words. In other words, this is a very important generalization about the lexical grammar of English or indeed any other language. The most frequent lexical items are the more frequent lexical grammatical items are, the more likely they are to grammatical. And if we magnify the top ones, this is what we get, the, and then it leaves the next one in the dust of, and then and, and then to, and a, a. So this is by far the most frequent item. <laughs> and here's a cartoonist take on it. Save the, this is what the placard says. The woman says, what? Definite article. As you can see from the frequency count, it's not exactly an endangered species. So that is, is, is it location in the word classes or parts of speech. A determiner, one of the determiners, a specific rather non-specific one. And determiners are, as we've already said, Nominal words, so words that make up the structure of nominal groups. And we've already looked at it from roundabout. What are the options? What are the choices? Either specify, specific, identifiable, or not, non-identifiable. And then the options of how to identify the referent of the nominal group. So as Halliday says, in the structure of the nominal group, the and other determiners come first, and they serve as deictic or pointing element, the element of the nominal group that informs us about the referential status of the nominal group, identifiable or not, and if identifiable, how. You take this example, his younger brother, then his is a possessive determiner, and it serves a deictic. The rest of the structure of the normal group, after the determiner, is a sequence of adjective noun, and they serve as epithet and thing. The thing is the phenomenon denoted by the normal group, and what comes before it are characterizations. So the property or the quality of this thing epithet younger brother and this is the typical sequence deictic epithet thing and here's a non-specific example a beautiful hummingbird the same structure but the deictic is non-specific rather than specific a beautiful hummingbird but once introduced into the narrative like this it can then be treated as identifiable, the hummingbird. So you can compare these. The high priest, the deictic is simply the, and then the thing is priest, and then this is not a qualitative characterization of the priest, but a classification of the priest, high priest, as opposed to another kind of priest. Now in this case, the classifier is an adjective, the thing is a noun, and of course the deictic is a determiner. Or another example from the same narrative, the messenger of the gods. Again you have the deictic, the, serving a realized by determiner, messenger the thing, realized by noun, 
and then a further modification of the thing coming after it qualifying it in some way we will call this a qualifier and this is always not just a single word but either a prepositional phrase in english or a clause typically a relative clause and this is hopefully we'll have to be able to discuss this in more detail this is one of the places where english and chinese differ because these embedded elements tend to come before the thing in chinese rather than after and then finally with a selected demonstrative this hummingbird simply diactic plus thing diactic is the determiner of this and the thing is a noun hummingbird as we have begun to explore the structure of the normal group both in terms of the classes of words that serve in normal groups and their functions so in a sense both in terms of the anatomy of the normal group and in terms of the physiology let's consider another example a bit longer those magnificent men in the flying machines Again, the first element is the determiner serving as the ectic, those. Then an epithet, magnificent. Then the thing itself, men. And then a qualification of the men in the flying machines, a prepositional phrase. So again, you have the determiner at the beginning the orientation to the whole group in terms of its identifiability status, those. You have an adjective, magnificent, and you have a noun, men, and then you have something that serves as if it was a word, but is really brought in from higher up in the constituency organization of the grammar. A phrase, a prepositional phrase, downranked to serve as a qualifier and i've taken this normal group from the title of a picture a film those magnificent men and the flying machines you could say it's a characteristic 1960s uh, kind of film the number of films of this kind uh, about races were comedies were produced in the 1960s so here you have the structure and you can have a little listen to this song that is used uh, as a theme in the film those magnificent men in the flying machines and hopefully it will help you remember the function of determiners and the system in the system of determination or dioxys <laughs> Man has conquered the heavens, broken the sound barrier, reached out for the moon. Now, after two years of production, the expenditure of millions, the assembling of an internationally renowned cast of stars, 20th Century Fox proudly brings you the fabulous, fantastic story of the men whose skill and courage started it all. <laughs> So there you go. Uh, maybe this will be something that help you, helps you remember those and other determiners, specific and non specific. So this is the end of stage two uh, in lecture two. I returned here to the mode of probing the grammar, asking questions. 
asking questions in order to show how we can explain features of the grammar when we go beyond the realms of traditional grammar and begin to ask or look at the grammar as a resource. And we relate this view of the grammar as a resource to its actual use in text, in context. Next, then, we'll talk about the three strands of meaning in the grammar. The focus on the determiner the and the other ones we're going to focus on one of the strands of meaning, the textual strand of meaning. But next we'll look at all three strands of meaning and we'll view them in terms of the most extensive environment of the grammar, that of the clause. The clause being the gateway of the grammar to the meaning of text in the semantics. Thank you.